Welcome back to Thinking Out Loud. My name is Sheldon McLeod, and uh, thank you for joining us here at the Saltwire Network. Again, find our YouTube channel, like, and subscribe. And, of course, a lot of discussion about, among other things, uh, what had happened when a woman went to the emergency department in Amherst and she succumbed to whatever was plaguing her medically at the time. But there was also this conversation about a letter uh, that was sent, a note or an email to uh, the minister, the independent member for uh, Cumberland North. And uh, today I received a a letter that uh, was released by uh, Nova Scotia's liberal leader. And in part, uh, it reads, you know, um, we need to understand what's going on here and uh, get a better picture of what's going on. Uh, It says here, my heart goes out to the Holtoff family who's dealing with an unimaginable loss. But Zach Churchill has some further questions. No room for political motivation in a situation as delicate as this. Uh, Zach Churchill uh, joins the conversation now. Uh, Zach Churchill, thank you again for doing this under these uh, these trying times for people. I know we're all thinking about Gunther and the family who suffered this loss, and of course, our thoughts and condolences are are with them during this time, during this time. Now, I had an opportunity to speak with Elizabeth Smith McCrossin about the letter that she received at 1140 at night, the email that she received about disclosing personal information. What was your thought when you heard that? I mean, I haven't heard of that happening before. A public servant uh, just before midnight on a Friday sending uh, a cease and desist letter to an MLA. Um, I really do not think that would have happened without direction uh, from the the premier or at the very least the premier's chief of staff or the the premier's office you know that is a very unusual thing to happen i think it's a very cold response uh, to the situation Um, elizabeth was representing her constituents at their behest they asked her to do this and she only shared information that was available publicly in the obituary uh, of alley so it's obvious that uh, she did nothing wrong she was doing her job as an mla and i really perceive that letter that came from from justice uh, to be uh, intimidation and attempt to try and 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 silence her voice at a time when her constituents uh, probably needed her the most you're a member of the legislative assembly you have been for years uh there are privacy issues and there are issues about a patient's confidentiality you're aware of you know what has to happen Uh, elizabeth smith mccrossin says she took those she had a a waiver signed Uh, and the tone of that uh, email or letter from the justice department seems to say well we think you have gone outside the boundaries and we think you should reconsider that uh that aside uh you know what about the balance between personal information public information and doing your job as a politician to represent the people that have put you in office Well, you certainly have to protect people's private health information. And I think if you look at what was shared by Elizabeth, she did not uh, share any information that was not already available to the public through the obituary for Allie. You know, her name, her her age, and that she had passed away. So there was no um, information that was shared that I think would be a breach of of privacy in this circumstance. And I think think that's pretty obvious. And and that's why the, the government has since revoked uh, the letter and said they're not going to be pursuing legal action because I do think that letter was motivated uh, by by politics and and not by any real concern over over privacy matters. And that's usually something that the privacy commission and that's usually something that the privacy uh, officer would would take on, not the Department of Justice. Uh, if there was uh, if there was concern there, that would usually fall under the jurisdiction of of, of, of the privacy officer. So I really think that, and, and listen, the, the, the public servant that did that, they're, they're, I really do not think that person did it um, on, on a whim or even at the, the request of, of someone senior to them in the department. Something like that does not happen that is of such a political nature that involves uh, an elected MLA unless it comes from the top. I really believe that. I've never seen anything like that happen. And having worked with public servants for... Um, you know, close to eight years in government, uh, I, I really do not think that would have happened without someone, and, and usually the, the, I'd say at least the Premier's Chief of Staff, sending out a directive to make sure that that happened at, at 11.40 on a Friday night. Right, and there's that uh, plausible deniability or whatever term you want to use, there's a chance, you know, the Premier on Monday in front of reporters said he didn't know the letter went out. Uh, you seem to be suggesting there's no way he wouldn't have known or do you feel someone else, perhaps within his close circle, decided? Listen, I, 
I, I like taking people at their word, but I think it's very unlikely that if the Department of Justice was going to take such an extreme action towards an elected member that um, somebody, at least in that office, didn't know about it. And I, I don't think it would have happened unless somebody in the, prim in the, in the Premier's office uh, directed uh, staff to, to do that. I, I, just, I, don't, I don't see that happening any other way. Now, as late as Sunday, uh, the Department of Health was saying, uh, sorry, the Nova Scotia Health Authority was saying private information and we're not to disclose it. We're not talking about it. But on, on Monday, the Minister of Health, the Premier also explicitly discussed or talked about this case, naming Alison Holthoff. And I got a sense that uh, somewhere between Friday and that letter and Monday, when the Premier was at that public event, the the policy or the their, their strategy changed, their communication policy changed or at least the way that they were going to approach this. I'm not sure how you feel about it as someone who's been in government who knows how this works and that there is cabinet confidentiality and all that goes with it. Uh, listen, obviously you have to protect people's privacy when it comes to their their their, their health and well-being and their health files. Uh, that's not the situation here. It makes sense that the government would have changed their kind of tactic on this issue because as soon as that letter is made public, there's no legal grounds to pursue any legal action against Elizabeth smith Um So as soon as that letter is made public uh, and they understand that they've made a mistake on it, then they pull the horns in, right? Uh, and I think Elizabeth rightly called their bluff on it and stood strong, as she's done in the past uh, in dealing. She used to be a member of the, the Tory caucus and she stood her ground in the past, not saying I've always agreed with her, uh, but she certainly um, has done that before and she did it. She did it now. And I'm quite happy about it because this is an important piece of information uh, for the for the public to have. You're right. This this family needed understanding empathy needed to figure out what happened what went wrong could something have happened to have changed the outcome and and Allie's death and we don't know the answers to those questions and we can't assume to know the answers now until there is the, the proper investigation or, or, or review done uh, but at the very least they needed some 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 empathy uh, from the government and they certainly didn't need to have their representative uh, be threatened by the Department of Justice for doing what they the family asked her to do and that was advocating on on their behalf and uh, talking about uh, her her case publicly because they had been doing the same thing. So, you know, I, it is. I really do think this is indicative of kind of the approach to healthcare that we're seeing under Houston, where there is a a big focus on the politics of healthcare. So a lot of announcements, uh, a lot of spending commitments. And I don't think enough attention is being paid to the outcomes in the healthcare system or listening to um, doctors and experts uh, that we have within the system to make sure that uh, the right things are happening and that the system's improving. Because we, we have only seen, even with all these spending announcements, all these pilot projects, the system deteriorate very rapidly at a rate that we haven't seen um, in, in the 12 years I've been uh, elected in office over the last 16 months. So it is, uh, it's, a, it's a dire situation. Um, Again, we, we do not know the specifics of, of Allie's case other than what her, of course, what her uh, husband has shared. Uh, but we don't know if, 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 if the outcome could have been different yet. Um, but that, that will be determined uh, based on the investigation. But there are, there are scary things happening in ERs from one end of the province to the other. The other some of them have closed down. There's stress like crazy in our emergency rooms. Our MLAs are, are getting calls on a, a weekly, if not daily basis of people concerned about the care they're receiving. And it's not the staff's fault, they're understaffed. Uh, there's an incredible amount of pressure uh, on our emergency rooms. And with the amount of people who need a family doctor almost doubling uh, under Houston to, to near 130,000, uh, of course, there's gonna be a lot of non-urgent pressure going into our emergency rooms. People that are looking for prescription renewals and, and lab tests ordered and this sort of thing. So uh, it's really not not a great situation there right now and people are under a lot of duress and and it's going to affect patient care, I think. Yeah, by the very nature of what an emergency department is, people are going to show up in a serious way and uh, it, not everybody's there for a prescription refill. Uh, the idea though that on average more than one person per day has passed away in an ER, and that goes back to 2017 through a freedom of information request uh, and through, through that I'm sure is data that you would have been presented with as the minister of health Absolutely. for the time that you served Absolutely. and 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 i gotta think that maybe it's tough to message this it's difficult to acknowledge this it's you know no one wants to hear this but i think not talking about it 
hasn't helped. You know, 500 deaths is a statistic. One death is a tragedy, and we've seen that. Do you do you feel that there's enough, perhaps, perhaps self interest introspection to say that we need to be honest with people about how it's possible that every day someone could die in an ER, and this is happening in our province. Absolutely. And it's happened under previous governments. Uh, you know, there was tragic deaths when I was Minister uh, of Health. And we do have to remember that people are going into the ER in a lot of cases for very severe grave uh, circumstances that, that, that can be life threatening. And in, in some, perhaps many cases, medical intervention is not necessarily going to um, save people at the state that they're potentially in in our emergency rooms. So the question is, uh, when you look at um, a situation like this one, is it automatically triggers a review and an investigation, and then what that will determine is could the could the outcome have been differently? Was there an issue with uh, service or practice um, or the medical intervention? And so it's really important to allow the system to take the time to look at these individual cases, to understand them, and to um, hopefully inform better practices moving forward to minimize the risk of, uh, of these things happening when, when saving life is possible. I asked this of Elizabeth Smith McCrossin. Uh, what responsibility does the CEO have in this? In that we have someone who has, by training, you know, been a lawyer who is put in a healthcare situation to run Nova Scotia's health department. Who necessarily might not know. Does it matter that the the current CEO doesn't have a background in health? What's your thought on, you know, the this situation and what may or may not be this person's responsibility? Well, well, here's my concern is that when elected, uh, Premier Houston fired a group of very competent medical experts, including Dr. Brendan Carr, who uh, took a year to recruit into our province, uh, pulled them in from BC, uh, a very well respected healthcare administrator. He's a doctor and uh, he, he managed the system during COVID. The system held during those first two years of the pandemic uh, in large part because of his ability to manage. Uh, Premier Houston also fired a board of experts and professionals and engaged citizens who were helping lead and direct our, uh, our health authority and, uh, and replaced them all with one person who's a, who's a Tory lawyer with no expertise in, in the healthcare system. And I, I do think, and I have said this since day one, that I believe that was a mistake. And uh, I do believe some of the management related issues that we're seeing are because there is a lack of experience um, at the helm. And, and that's that's what I mean by putting the politics of healthcare above the outcomes, right? You you know, Premier Houston obviously wanted someone in there he could trust that would, uh, you know, do his bidding, uh, hopefully execute on uh, his, his, his agenda. Um, but when you, uh, you know, force a kind of expertise and experience uh, for, uh, you know, a friend or someone that, that, that's there because they're loyal, uh, I, I don't think that necessarily helps. Um, yeah, and just to be clear, I did ask for an interview with Karen Oldfield. I was kind of surprised that no one else in media had asked for, and there's a chance I may not get that if I'm being critical of her, but that's fine. Um, I think that it's important to at least ask these questions and to ask for the interviews. And all of this to to come back around to the politics of this letter, this idea that, you know, there may be a, a, a sense that, well, we won't talk about it, but you're not talking about one death when there's up to 500 a year, or 558 in 2022. And Healthcare is in a really tough place. The canary in the coal mine is the emergency department. So Zach Churchill, as a former minister, as a former member of government, how do how do we deal with this? I mean, it's the premier's. He promised to fix healthcare, but this should be an all party. Every party should have some input in helping fix this. We, we've got it, and this is something that we tried to do over there. We've got to try to take the politics out of this and have uh, medical professionals lead that system and trust them to do the best. Of, uh, their, their, their ability possible to do that. Um, it's hard to take healthcare out of the realm uh, of politics. It's where most of the public dollars go. And of course, uh, particularly when a situation like this happens, everybody's attention uh, is on the healthcare system. And um, there, there's no way, I think, to get around that. But we certainly do have, have to try. Uh, but there are some things I think we can do to improve the system, right? Obviously, you know, more docs is important. 
Um, recognizing that the family docs are practicing very differently. They're taking less patients than previous generation. We have to adjust the kind of model of delivery to meet that new model of practice. I think we have to find alternative access points for primary care for people that don't have a family doctor. Uh, we brought in virtual care. Uh, the conservatives have, have uh, continued with that. That is a, a good thing, although it's frustrating for people. But we also have to look at our pharmacists. I learned when I was in health that we were doing the vaccination rollout. We had one of the most equitable distributions of vaccines in the whole country because we utilize um, uh, primarily our, our pharmacies. There's pharmacies in every single community and our pharmacists are not allowed in Nova Scotia to practice to their full scope of expertise um, because of the uh, kind of regulation regime that we have here. We began to expand their scope of practice with certain prescription renewals, but they can do a lot more renewals for prescriptions. They can do, um, you know, lab, lab, lab requisitions uh, and these sorts of things as well. They're trained to do this. They just have to be paid and allowed uh, to do this. And, and, you know, if they have support from government, we can have a new access point for people that need their prescriptions renewed, that need to get a, a you know, blood, blood work ordered uh, in our pharmacies. And then we don't have to have this non-urgent uh, pressure coming into our emergency rooms. Um, I think that's, uh, that is absolutely key uh, to doing this. And I think right now where we have so much respiratory illness going around, the government has to be uh, honest about what's happening and uh, keeping people up to, to, to speed on the impacts of, of not just COVID, but influenza on our hospitals so that people can um, adjust their behavior uh, uh, accordingly. Um, and I think just having that information out there and bringing people's attention to it would be helpful. But again, uh, the Houston government has taken that information away. They're more concerned about the public relations around healthcare, I think, uh, than, than, you know, what, what's actually happening within the system. So they, they want it. They don't want bad news. They want to, they don't want bad information getting out there. They even, they even question the validity of the list of people that need a family doctor, you know, after four years of pounding the previous government over the, the you know, the numbers on that list. So uh, we need more information, we need more transparency on health care, and uh, we need to be thinking outside of the box in terms of how people are accessing primary care, and uh, we can't just rely on the old kind of fee-for-service model uh, for doctors because they're, they're not practicing that way anymore, those that are even getting into family medicine. So. Um, there's a lot of changes that are needed there, and I, I think there's there's not no silver bullets, but small steps you can take, some big steps you can take to at least relieve some of the pressure and help the system hold during this time, and give people what and give people what they need, right? Give people what they need to a better better extent than we are now. So, so again, critical of the letter that went out, uh, but I guess to maybe co opt a little bit of uh, this conversation, your thoughts leaving on uh, Health Minister Thompson and the work that she's doing. Listen, I have uh, I have a lot of respect for Michelle Thompson. Uh, she obviously cares deeply about the healthcare system. Is uh, I think doing doing her best to be a good steward of that system. Uh, she's always forthright in answering questions in in the legislature. So that's my experience with her. Uh, but that said, I, I I I don't think the Houston government overall um, has a plan to improve healthcare. I do think people are getting disappointed because they took him at his word that he had the solutions to fix it. And he, pre he presented himself as, as, as the savior of healthcare in, in the last election. I think uh, people uh, are realizing that, you know, there are no simple solutions to this. And you can promise all the big things that he promised, like universal mental health care coverage, 24 seven surgeries, uh, I think 300 new doctors a year, um, he promised, you know, um, you, you can make all these big promises, but Getting to those things is a very challenging thing, uh, particularly during a time when we have a labor shortage. So I, I think people are starting to see that those promises were not necessarily possible of achieving and that potentially there wasn't a plan, uh, a real plan to achieve them um, from the beginning. It was more of a marketing plan to get elected. Uh, he is the elected representative for Yarmouth. He's also the leader of His Majesty's official opposition. Zach Churchill, as always, thank you for your time today. Thank you, sir.